Shalom. Welcome to Monday School. As we start today, I think it appropriate for us to pray for the church in Ukraine. Let's look to the Lord, shall we? Gracious Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to call upon your name. We are thankful as we look around about us and see the many ways in which we have been blessed. <clears throat> and when we see the film footage from what is going on in Ukraine, our hearts break for our brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing that they did not ask for this any more than we have. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would watch over them, protect them, provide for them, show us ways in which we can contribute to the needs of those who are going through this horror. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would come upon the scene, show yourself mighty to save, and strong to deliver. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we study your word. We ask that you would give us wisdom and insight, not only to these truths, but how to apply these truths to the way that we live. And these things we ask together in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our lesson this morning is in Psalm 36. It is Psalm 36. Excuse me. <coughs> Psalm 36. It's 12 verses, relatively brief. Let me read it, and then as is our pattern, we'll go back and work our way through. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or to hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. A sobering picture as we look at the whole of this message, but there is not only that sobering ending, but uplifting thought throughout the, the text. Going back to verse 1, 
I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. That the psalmist is not just composing something that he thinks is a good editorial to uh, let the, those who do evil know that they're not approved of. That the message that he has is in his heart. And uh, the, the reason why his heart is burdened, why, why he feels so deeply of the need to cry out is because of the sinfulness of the wicked. Now, where does sin have its root? Where does it come from? And I think if we go all the way back to the very beginning, we can see that the next phrase in verse 1 sort of covers the subject uh, and, and does so with minimum words. It says, There is no fear of God before their eyes that they are not afraid of God. And, and now, when we talk about fear of God, uh, this is not a uh, the, the same kind of fear that you would face if there were some, if you were being attacked by an animal. But it is a reverence and awe and understanding that he is high and lifted up and that we are dust and uh, that that we are at, at, at best recipients from his hand and if we set ourselves against him that we do so to our own peril not so with the wicked there is no fear of God before their eyes. And uh, most recently, I don't know if you have heard this. Uh, I don't know how widely this advertisement is played, but uh, recently there is an ad that features Ronald Reagan Jr. And he is uh, trying to promote the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And in the process of doing so, he, he says, uh, I'm not afraid to say things that would suggest that I'll go to hell since I don't believe in it. Uh, and if you, if you listen, that's not an exact quote, but that's the, the way that his thinking is. There is no fear of God before their eyes, before the eyes of those who have chosen a pathway of wickedness. And verse 2 kind of fills in whatever gaps might be left. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves. And the flattery that they have for themselves, it says they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. First of all, they don't detect their sin. They refuse to recognize what they're doing as sin. And... Uh, it was about 30 seconds into my salvation experience that I became absolutely horrified 
at what a sinful creature I was. At the moment I confessed, I, I felt the weight of my sin, but I didn't get it. Just how horrible uh, a violator of God's will and way I had been. And that, I guess it was, being in the presence of God that all of a sudden, it was as if nothing that I'd ever done in my life had been of any value whatsoever because it had been done with a heart that was not at peace with God, in a heart that was set on its own way rather than the, the will of God. They flatter themselves too much to detect their sin or to hate their sin. And this is one of the things that I think it needs to be cultivated and we need to be reminded that our, our attitude towards sin should not be, oh, that was naughty. Um, but that it is abhorrent, that it is, uh, it would be the equivalent that, that the, the hatred that we should have for sin would be the same as, as if we were being served sewage for a meal. Uh, it wouldn't take us very long to figure out that this is not what we wanted to be a part of, and not only would we not tarry over it, not only would we not partake of it, but we wouldn't hang around the, the, the site. We would get out of there. Um, so they uh, flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin, cultivating a hatred for sin. Not the sinner, but developing the same attitude towards sin that we find present in God who uh, has said clearly that the wages of sin is what? Death. So, moving on to verse 3. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. First of all, the words of their mouths. He doesn't just say their words or their thoughts. The issue is not that they thought something that uh, they, they conceived of whatever this evil was, but then they've got to publish it. They've got to spread it. They've got to make sure that somebody else weighs in with them, that misery loves company. And when those who are bent on doing evil... Uh, get underway in the process of doing evil. They want partners. They want somebody to come along for the ride. And so the words of their mouth, that's how they communicate it. That's how the evil spreads. They don't just think of it. They announce it. And they pronounce it. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. I want you to keep that in mind as you're watching television, listening to the radio. And it's possible, of course, to when you pick up a book. How does, how does it stack up when measured through the lens of Scripture uh, that that Everybody always wants to analyze Scripture from a worldly 
standpoint, what we need to be doing is analyzing the world and its activities through the lens of Scripture. How does it measure up? So, <clears throat> the words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Now, to act wisely. What is that? To act in accordance with the solid, valid information that you have at hand. That if you ignore that information and choose a path that is counter to that information, then you are not acting wisely. That if somebody has told you not to put a dinner fork into an electrical socket because it'll create a problem, you'll get a shock, and you may set your house on fire. Uh, that if you choose to do it anyway, just to see what happens. I had a friend who actually closed a knife switch. He was in the physics lab and he closed a knife switch with a screwdriver. And the school was out, this is a school that had 3,000 students and the school was out without power for a morning uh, because of that little move. A great big blue flash and then darkness. He act, did not act wisely. He knew better. He just said to himself, I wonder what would happen if, and he found out. They fail to act wisely or do good. And it's not enough just to gather good information, but to act in a way that brings about good, good for yourself and good for others. Acts of kindness, that's doing good. Courtesy, uh, looking for opportunities to be an encouragement to, we usually don't think in these kind of terms, uh, modern language, but to, to be a blessing, to find a way to help somebody who's having a difficult time have a less difficult time. That's to do good. On the other hand, the evil, verse 4, even on their beds, they plot evil. That's what the wicked do. That even when they're resting, they're trying to come up with a new way to do something revolting. Uh, years ago, I knew of an individual who actually lived a, a high moral standard, but his hobby was planning a bank robbery. Find something positive to do in your spare time. This passage right here would fly in the face of the idea of for entertainment I'm going to plan something criminal even if you never intend to do it. It's it's cultivating a way of thinking that draws you away from the Lord. Even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves. They lock in. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not 
reject what is wrong. I don't know that this is, I, I have no way of validating this story, but I read recently about a woman who was on an airplane flight and the man in the seat next to her, that, that they were in first class and they brought a meal to them and she ate her meal and he left his meal untouched. And while he was while she was eating, during his mealtime, he had his hands clasped and his head down, and she assumed that uh, he was praying. So when she finished her meal and they came and they took away his, his food untouched, she, she asked him, she said, I couldn't help but notice that you didn't eat. Is there a reason why you're fasting? And he said, yes, I'm a Satanist. And our coven has pledged to fast and pray that 100 Christian pastors will fall from grace this year. That is somebody who is committed to an evil course. And the question, of course, for us is, are we as committed to the course of righteousness? They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. And we must learn to reject wrong. That which is wrong, as we become aware of it in any form, we must reject it. We must embrace holiness. After all, the word tells us clearly, without holiness, no man or woman shall see the Lord. Verse 5. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. The word there love, that is translated love is this wonderful Hebrew word chesed, which is often translated not just love, but loving favor or uh, covenant love, that, that this is a, a deep connection. This is not a passing emotional spike. This is, uh, as we're talking about commitment, this is a commitment to relationship um, and that the, the love the chesed of God reaches to the heavens, goes as high as it can go, and the faithfulness of God that reaches to the skies. This is classic Hebrew poetry where it doesn't rhyme, but it has parallel thought and uh, so, chesed and faithfulness, attributes of God, and it reaches to the heavens, it fills the skies. Verse 6, your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Here's another parallel couplet. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. Righteousness. Uh, and, and when it talks about justice, this is not uh, the axe falling on the head of the chicken. Not that kind of justice. But that this is seeking 
to make certain that those who are in need are having their needs, needs met in and through the loving action of the Christian community. That is one form of justice, of being on the lookout for discrimination and standing against it, standing for those who are in difficult straits, like our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. That is part of seeking justice. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. It's saying, you're Lord of creation. And that when it says that he preserves both, that he's in the business of providing our needs. The old timers used to use the word providence, and that's what it means. The provision for that God making a way, and uh, sometimes it's, it's in a way that is not uh, obvious, but nonetheless, God is in the background orchestrating things that will come out to the benefit of his people. And of course, God is willing that none should perish so part of his providence is that he is ever working to do those things which open the eyes of the lost, not only to their need of a savior, but the provision he has made to save them in and through the finished work of Jesus Christ. How priceless is your unfailing love, unfailing love. Again, this is chesed. Um, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. One of my favorite creatures is the prairie hen. That it's a, essentially a wild chicken and uh, they were at one time very abundant on the, on the prairie. And one of the greatest dangers on the prairie. Now, by the way, the prairie hen makes her nest on the ground. So she is, uh, has in mind defending her nest from whatever predators that there might be but one of the worst dangers that her little clutch would face would be a prairie fire. And in the event of a fire, the prairie hen gathers her chicks to herself, and they're extremely well insulated with all of their feathers so that they uh, can endure the cold winters on the prairie, the north in the north central U.S., but they, that she will sit down in the event of a fire while other animals are fleeing, that she will gather her brood and sit down over them, cover them with her feathers, with her wings, and stay in place. Fighting and, and it's just the way that they're wired internally that while other animals run and flee to protect their lives, that she stays put despite the fire. And her number one concern is that her chicks survive the fire. And the that, that she will die in place, but the chicks will survive the fire. That she has given her life to preserve her brood. And that is a, a picture 
of exactly what God did for us in Christ. That the fire of sin is on its way, but Jesus Christ, like that prairie hen, covered us over. We're beneath his wings. And because of his death, we need not fear death. Verse 8. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. Once again, God is a providing God. He takes care of us. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. So not only is our thirst quenched, but that we are given vision and insight that we will not otherwise have. It is in or by your light that we see light. That as you're reading God's word, there are times when you will come across something that uh, it'll be, you may have read it numerous times, but all of a sudden it'll take on a brand new meaning, and part of that is the light that God gives us. That by His light, we see light. Continue your love, chesed, to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. So why is it so important for us to cultivate uprightness of heart that we may continue in loving relationship with God? The other side of that coin, may the foot of the proud not come against me. God's going to defend me. Nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. Part of the same thought. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. That's a terrible thing to be thrown down. It's a terrible thing to not be able to rise, but there's little something in there that causes me to sort of leap with joy. The last word of this psalm that's translated rise here is the Hebrew word kum. And if you recall the story in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, of Jairus's daughter who had died and Jesus went to wake her up and when he said that she was only sleeping uh, the King James says that he they laughed him to scorn but Jesus went in and took her hand and said Talitha which means little girl Talitha kum rise and we need to understand and rejoice in the reality that our Savior has the power to cause us to rise even in the face of death thank you O Lord that you have the words of life. Would you now take these words, our meditations, our studies, and use these, these things, these thoughts and these words 
to, to help us move further down the road toward that day when we will turn a corner and we will meet you face to face. Find us faithful, we pray, in your blessed and holy name. Amen.